I think it was in my DNA. My father was a motorcycle rider. And I always wanted that freedom, just to get on it and turn the key, that's it, you're gone. I felt like I knew Vincent forever, because he's so welcoming. One of those guys that's a true friend to everyone that he meets. He's just a person that is involved with the community. He does so much for men's health and so much advocacy work. Since day one, he never stopped helping others. This old doctor in the ER came out and said, your husband's injuries are life-threatening. So I started on my brother's scooter. In Saint-Tropez, being directly on the coast, we have fairly decent weather. It's a lot of small country roads. For two wheels, it's paradise. My brother was a lot more mature and a lot less daredevil than I was. At 13, I started borrowing his scooter, crashing in once. I turned 14 and I really, really wanted mine and I already had the idea of the scooter I wanted, the pipe I was going to put on. You have no idea how much things you can do on a 50cc. My father told me, you know, it's out of question. You'll never have a scooter or a motorcycle until you can buy yourself one. At 14, I found my first job unloading a food truck at 4.30 in the morning. Less than a month after, I was uh, showing up home on my scooter. That was my first um, motorized two wheels. When I first arrived in New York, I was 20. I was young and stupid. Work, 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 party, party, party. When you're 20, you can work a whole day, party all night, and look fresh and rested. The very next day, it doesn't happen anymore. He was my next door neighbor in Sunnyside, Queens. I was dating someone and he was dating someone, or many someones. Both of our roommates hated the people that we were dating. So they decided, because they used to drink together in the afternoons while we were working, that they were gonna set us up. One night I came home from work and my roommate was on the balcony smoking a cigarette and she said, we'll invite him up, what's the worst that can happen, right? I think we got into an argument the very first night that we met. We've been arguing ever since. It's gonna be 17 years in June that we're together. We got married, we're settling and everything is good. And in about 10 years, I barely left New York. And I'm there, you know, something's missing. I had my car driving license. Let me just get, you know, a motorcycle driving license. Before I had actually passed the exam, I had bought a motorcycle. A Scarlet Red T100. And fairly soon after I bought the motorcycle, I stopped working at the lounge because I was working there day and night. My wife gave me an ultimatum. Either I leave the place or we get divorced. We didn't feel having a life with someone you know, out of the house 18 hours a day, which was a very, very valid point. So she told me, you know, uh, yeah, we're gonna lose a lot of money, uh, but at the same time, a divorce would cost you a lot more. <laughs> I needed to take a little break, and I did the uh, US 66 round trip in 13 days. I left from New York, and I went up to Chicago, and from Chicago, I followed US 66 all the way to Santa Monica Piers by myself. With just a tent and a sleeping bag <laughs> on the brand new bike.
Well, I had a, a small group of friends I was riding with. You do meet a lot of French people in New York, but not French people on a bike. Vincent I met summer of 2012. I could tell that Vincent was an open guy, he loved people. We would ride here and there, and then we became very good friends, and he would do a lot of barbecues. He was always saying, hey guys, you know, come around at my house, let's throw a barbecue. And I would love his espressos, but he needed an upgrade on that espresso machine, so. One of the group members heard of the DGR and started to talk to us about it. DGR stands for Distinguished Gentleman's Ride. People show up very dapper and they all ride together for two, three hours. That sounds like fun. I have the bike. Back then I was, you know, wearing suit every day. Let me do it. So I sign up. The goal is actually to raise fund and make people aware of men's disease. We have 22 floors in the office. Five, six hundred people in the building, I should be able. I'm gonna go, you know, with 500 bucks. And I started, you know, going around, you know, asking people. I met my $500 goal, I think, on the second day. So I would every day pretty much increase my goal. I would start to reach out to more and more people because I was becoming confident. And on the first year I uh, participated as a fundraiser, I finished fifth worldwide. Back then I was, what, 34 or something? Really never heard about prostate cancer. I knew I had a prostate somewhere, you know, up there, but I never went to look for it. So I actually learned everything about prostate cancer because of the DGR and thanks to the DGR. For me, I was just, yeah, I do something good and everything is fine and everything. Until the second year. The second year, I had people actually starting and coming to me. Co-workers. People I knew for years and work yeah, and I had no idea that I actually had uh, prostate cancer. That what really uh, was a, an awakening, because suddenly it was real. Suddenly the guy, you know, sitting at the desk you pass by every day, you know that guy is fighting prostate cancer. You know the guy two floor above uh, is actually a survivor. And then you have the people that are left behind, the relatives, the friends, the brothers and the sisters, the children very often of people who died from prostate cancer. Suddenly, you know, it, it had a face. It really motivated me. I didn't give a damn anymore. I would just go straight in people's face and every year I would increase and increase and increase my goals. Vincent has been, for the past four years, one of the largest contributors in terms of fundraising to the DGR, not only in the US, but worldwide. I can do what I can do because of the very specific situation, workplace I am and everything, but I'm, I'm really no one special. And when I had the accident, it was surprising to see the response. Sunday, Sunday, February 10th. My son was with my in-laws. As we had the day for ourselves, my wife and I, she was doing her own thing in the house, and I went to work in the garage. I had a brand new Boba Black. I had decided to put a Speedmaster tank on the Boba Black. So I started by disconnecting the tank, and I just put it in the corner of the garage, not paying attention that with the fuel pump open, there was some gas leaking from it. The gas leaking, made his way all the way up to my gas heater. And at some point I see some light, a fire from the gas heater starting to move towards the gas tank. So I immediately stopped what I was doing, jumped, grabbed my fire extinguisher. That did not work. Two seconds after, I had flames already all over one side of my garage. So I rushed towards the remote that allows me to open the garage door. I hear the garage motor kicking it, and I start to see the light outside. As my way out of the garage uh, was appearing, fresh air came in the garage as well. And that's when there was a big explosion. I just felt that gigantic ball coming on me and feeling that warm feeling on my face. I just threw myself under the door and then I put myself standing up and I realized that I'm on flame completely. I knew that the garage was gone, but at the entrance, I still had my gas heater with two propane tank with flames on them. You're screaming, call 911, call 911, like running in and out of the house like a lunatic. And I picked up five more fire extinguisher, emptied the five fire extinguisher 
on the gas tank. But during that entire time, I did not feel any pain. Thinking, you know, I'll make a run the ER, they'll put a couple of bandage and I'll be fine. The fire department got there super duper fast. The people next door, like running out, everybody is just kind of staring at him, like standing there with no shirt on, with like skin hanging off of him. They told me that an EMS was coming to pick me up. And I looked at myself in a mirror and that's where I was like, okay, maybe it's, you know, gonna take a little bit more than a few bandage. I didn't have any eyelash, eyebrows, everything. I had lost a lot of hair. I was smoking. The ambulance comes and they put him in the ambulance. And it's when I lay down on my back that I start to feel there was something that, um, um, it was something that wasn't right. And I started slowly to freak out a little bit. The whole way there, now he's apologizing. He's like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. That was the scariest part was when he was apologizing because I kept thinking, oh my God, he's gonna die. I'm not sure if, if I slept or if I went down in between. I remember my wife being there. And, uh, and that was it, I think, for the first day. I stayed with him till like 10 o'clock at night, but I had to come home to my son. He had no idea what was going on. And um, so my, my dad met me here with my son and the fire marshals were already here. And my son like went up to his room. I saw him peeking out the window. And so seven years old now, seven and a half, you could tell it was hard on him. And, and that's what's horrible to me, because he never has radio that shit. So yes. Vincent came to us with a 40% burn, and a 40% burn is life-threatening. There's no reason to think in the United States today that he shouldn't survive, but you're dangling a little bit. There is a chance you won't. When I heard, I just went straight to the hospital, and he was, he was up, but you don't want to see somebody like that. You know, you don't want to see your, you don't want to see anyone, let alone your friend. Seeing the pictures in the garage, if somebody had said the person didn't survive, I, I wouldn't have been surprised. Initially, he was very swollen uh, to the point where custom compression garments were not working, which also initially did create uh, additional um, discomfort, decrease in motion. That's a torture device, compression gloves. Uh, for my hand and fingers. That's um, the entire sleeve before I put, yep. Then there's uh, other what kind of Papa. devices. Papa? Oui, mon amour. Um, can I please have a nice pop? Basically the whole community uh, like was worried and we started to get in contact with this family and try to see how we could help. It started, you know, with uh, my three writing friends creating the GoFundMe page. Then it's been an outpouring Steve heard that Vincent Nikolai, another rider in New York, needed some help. Steve has decided to put his bike up on eBay. All of the proceeds are going to go to Vincent and his family to help out with their needs. I've actually never met Vincent. When he had his accident and news spread about it, um, I saw how it affected everybody. And to see the New York motorcycle community come together like that, there's nothing like that. When we heard about Vincent Nikolai, we really decided that we should do something about it. So we put together a raffle for him. At the Moto Market, raised two thousand eighty dollars for Vincent Nikolai's GoFundMe. It's so nice that we all came together to help him, whatever way, shape, or form that he needed. Trying to give him all the love that you know a friend could give him for him and his family. But you don't really need to motivate him because he is such a power of nature. I remember this picture where he had this T-shirt saying "French people eat pain for breakfast," and he was lying on his bed with this and say, you know, like it is what it is. When I found out about his accident, it was an absolute shock and really hard to take in. But finding out about it through a million people that message me is a testament to the person that he is. Everyone was really affected by it because he's such an important member of kind of our motorcycle community and certainly the DGR appreciates him very much. So we're just going to give back a little bit. It's a little token, but we want to surprise him with some helmets that he lost. Hey Vincent, guys, what are you doing? Come out and say I'm hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad I came home early today. Oh. We have a surprise for you. Hi. 
What's happening? You've gained some admiration, but you lost a few trinkets. My husband's motorcycle thing has been always like his thing. And I never until then understood the magnitude of the motorcycle community, the way that they came together to help my family. I don't even know how to begin thanking them. I would have never imagined that someone like me, the way I see myself, would actually trigger this type of reaction. And I'm so glad I have so, so, so much support from everyone. But uh, I know you're good. We're going to Canada on a trip next year and get a better espresso machine because that one is... All the best, man. We love you. I'm proud of you. We're all really proud of you and we know how much work it's taken to get here. Keep doing your exercises. Make those crepes every Sunday. Hang in there. Stay positive. Take it easy. Thank you for everything you've done for us and DJR and men's health. We love you. You're a legend. Go again. <laughs> no way!